good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and very warm welcome to Chris Patton. Uh, Chris and I did the same gig um, here about um, five or six years ago, I think, with uh, a book of memoirs more broadly on diplomatic life called Not Quite the Diplomat, but uh, this time is... Uh, is this time is different. But first of all, let me thank Liz and Richard Strang for sponsoring this afternoon's uh, session. Very grateful uh, to them. I suppose with a Chinese session, we should call them Strang Richard um, and <laughs> Strang Elizabeth. Um, but uh, anyway, which, uh, whichever order uh, is fine. Um, the interesting thing about this book, and I compare it with the previous one, is that this book rather largely predates the book we discussed five or six years ago uh, because this is a book about uh, Chris Patton's time as governor of Hong Kong. Uh, for those of you for whom this doesn't seem like yesterday, although it does to me, in the 92 election um, when he was the member for Bath, the uh, Liberal Democrats in Bath injudiciously kicked him out. Um, and although he had, as chairman of the Conservative Party, masterminded the 92 election win, which few expected at the time, if you remember that was the time that Kinnock looked as if he was about to, do, about to win, that um, whilst um, Chris won the war, he lost the battle um, and then was made uh, governor of, of Hong Kong, about which he has written. It is, um, I should say, a weighty tome, uh, and I mean that literally. Uh, it is extremely heavy. Um, and I, I say this uh, because um, it may be that you want to ensure that your chauffeur or your butler or whoever you've brought um, carries the book home uh, for, on your behalf. Um, but most of it is a contemporaneous diary of the years as governor in the splendid surroundings of Government House in Hong Kong. But it's bookended with two, I think, very useful and informative sections. One is an explanation of the background to the joint declaration, which was signed by Margaret Thatcher, actually, to give um, Hong Kong back to the Chinese, if I might put it that way. And at the end, there's a review of uh, more recent developments in Hong Kong, the security law, the demonstrations, the crackdowns, uh, etc. So um, the first question, Chris, I think is probably an inevitable one, is why publish this now? Because your diaries ended uh, 25 years ago. What were you uh, aiming to achieve by publishing this today? It's the only time in my life that I've uh, kept uh, a diary. Um, uh, I went there, as you say, um, inadvertently when the governor of Hong Kong was chosen by the liberal voters in Bath. Um, <laughs> John Major says in his memoirs he'd been intending to make me Chancellor of the Exchequer, so um, I was saved by the liberals in Bath from becoming uh, Norman Lamont, which was, uh, <laughs> which was uh, something I should be grateful for. Sweet are the uses of adversity, as, as it says in uh, As You Like It. Um, so I, I kept a diary. Um, during my first uh, two and a half years, I dictated something every week um, on what had happened during the week. Um, uh, then Michael Heseltine came on a visit, and it was so funny that I thought I'd have to start writing every day. And from then on, I wrote uh, every day. First three and a half years, I was sending these tapes back to one of my PAs in London, who subsequently became a Church of England priest. So. Maybe that had something to do with it. To do with it. Uh, so I have all these in the cellar at home. I have all these boxes of papers and the hardbacks. And I'd promised at some stage to give them to the Bodleian Library in Oxford. And the years went past, and then the lockdown came along. And I looked at the papers again, wanting something to do. And my wife suggested that before I sent them to the Bodleian, Maybe I should read them myself. <laughs> um, I read them myself. Um, I then looked at the ministerial rules on publishing, um, which I seem to know more about than the cabinet secretary or the permanent secretary <laughs> in the foreign office, which may not surprise, and discovered that after 10 or 15 years, um, you don't have to get things cleared because the assumption is anybody who was working for you 
and might be embarrassed by what you said, um, will have um, uh, uh, disappeared, gone to her or his maker. Um, so I read them and thought that they might be an interesting tale for other people to read. And I turned about 950,000 words into, so which would have been an even weightier tone, <laughs> uh, into 250,000. And there it is. And I do think that partly because of what's happened in the last few years in China, um, they bear out some of the prejudices or opinions I had at the time. And you don't normally write something which will show what a schmuck you were. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, I can I can see that. But I mean, so so the um, the the story, uh, if I might summarise it extremely briefly, is that um, is of your struggles to introduce elements of, of democracy and also elements of um, a legal framework, the Court of Final Appeal, which uh, gets a lot of attention in your in your book. Um, uh, and essentially the argument against what you were trying to do by people who would claim to have been sort of in the real politique school, I guess they would say, was that, you know, well, look, uh, China's China. There's no point in wasting our time on this. We've done the deal. Um, and so, um, you know, stop bothering your little head about these uh, details. But, I mean, do you think, in retrospect, that essentially the die was cast when we signed a joint declaration and that we did actually sign away um, Hong Kong uh, and its nascent uh, democracy at that point and that, therefore, in retrospect, you were sort of wasting your time? Or do you think there were still really big issues to fight for? I think there were big issues to fight for, but I think it's per perfectly reasonable to say um, how confident you were that, you'd, that Hong Kong would win, that Hong Kong would remain a free, um, open society under the rule of law. Um, the issue of passing Hong Kong back to China meant that it was in a totally different position to any other colony. Normally with a colony, with our colonies, um, we uh, were preparing them for independence, um, and we did that we put together uh, uh, bicameral legislature, doc, doc, um, uh, democracy, judges in wigs, and we put the whole thing on a launch pad, lit the blue touch paper and blasted it off and hoped we would go into orbit. Hong Kong was never like that because um, part of Hong Kong we'd only acquired on a lease um, for 99 years and it was always going back to China. So the difficulty w with Hong Kong we, was we were planning for a sort of um, docking in outer space with this, very different, uh, with this very different system. And I, I, I report in the book about what, a conversation I had with somebody in a mental hospital towards the end of my period. Um, I'm, I'm, as I'm going through the mental hospital, he, he very polite Chinese fellow, in a three-piece suit, and he calls, and um, uh, Pang Ting Hong, he said, using my nickname, uh, could I ask you a question? And to the horror of my officials and my bodyguards, I say, fine, I wander across and talk to him. And he said, would you agree, um, Governor, he said, that Britain is the oldest democracy in the world? And I said, some people will say that. And he said, would you agree that China is the last, uh, is the biggest communist tyranny in the world? And I said, well, I wouldn't put it in quite those terms. <laughs> so he said, well, could you explain to me how it is um, that Britain, the last great um, parliamentary democracy, the greatest parliamentary democracy, um, is handing over the people in this free society to the last, to the largest communist tyranny in the world without ever asking people what they think. And that was the moral and political problem, actually on both sides. For us, it really was a dilemma, but we didn't have any option. And we tried in the joint declaration, which Margaret Thatcher had, um, had uh, negotiated, we tried to um, write a, a treaty which would guarantee uh, Hong Kong's position for 50 years after 1997. It was based on a, on, a, on a mantra of Deng Xiaoping, which was probably designed principally for Taiwan and even Tibet, one country, two systems, that Hong Kong would become part of the, quote, motherland, um, but would retain its large degree of autonomy and its way of life for, for 50 years. A question we were always reluctant to ask ourselves was whether the Chinese Communist Party actually understood what the Hong Kong system was beyond um, gambling on horses and dancing, as I think Deng Xiaoping uh, once put it. Um, but, the, but the guarantee from China was clear that Hong Kong would remain the same.
And uh, I mean, I got a reputation for becoming a sort of latter-day Tom Paine, but really all I was trying to do was to ensure that as far as possible, um, uh, Hong Kong's guarantees of remaining the same um, were, were properly in place. Um, my principal uh, critic was a very clever, a rather acerbic diplomat called Percy Craddock, who said that um, uh, about the Chinese with whom he negotiated the joint declaration on Thatcher's behalf, he said, um, they may, he said, be thuggish dictators, but they're men of their word. Well, we know part of that is, is, is true. <laughs> um, so um, I, I think in, by 1997, we hoped that Hong Kong would remain much the same. And I think it's fair to say that, that, that until um, uh, the Chinese arriving, um, that, that until I, I think uh, um, about 2012, 2011, 2012, by and large, Hong Kong was was left much as it much as it had been, but I think that uh, Xi Jinping, as as uh, the Chinese dictator, has been I mean a big change in the way Hong Kong's handled. Yeah, I mean let me pick up the point about uh, Percy Craddock. I mean he's uh, he's now passed on, so uh, de mortuis should be our guideline there. But um, there were plenty of other people, uh, ambassadors to Beijing, particularly um, who. Uh, were opposed to your line, and we learn a lot about that. Um, and uh, also, there were politicians. Um, I mean, you tell rather amusing stories about how Michael Heseltine was obsessed with the success of a big trade mission to China and didn't want anything to disturb that. But I have to say, um, and I, I think in these introductions, one's supposed to be hitting uh, bowling up balls that the other side uh, can hit. But let me try one that's maybe slightly controversial. But I was struck that. In the book, you're always rather kinder to the other politicians you disagreed with than to the officials. So, for example, at one point you say, there's no point in having a row with Malcolm Rifkind, who is a good man. Now, he was opposing you at the time. Mm. On the other hand, his officials have behaved in a sneaky way. Are there some echoes here of firing Tom Scholar um, and of no. you know, blaming the officials, whereas the problem was also an, among the cabinet? No, and actually you're wrong about Malcolm Rifkind. He was a huge supporter. And one of the reason why, reasons why some officials behaved in a rather foolish way was I was never going to be let down or cut adrift by people like John Major or Douglas Hurd or Malcolm Rifkin or Ken Clark, all of whom had been my friends, all of whom um, uh, were, were colleagues of mine. And I'm, I'm not remotely um, rude about most of the officials who worked for me in Hong Kong, for no, example. That's okay. People like yeah. Hugh Davis and William Ehrman and Bob Pierce and so on, and particularly my Hong Kong officials. I am a bit... Uh, rude, about two or three who I thought in, in London um, were um, at every stage trying to second guess what we were doing. Uh, but the very first um, uh, person I, who was in charge of the Hong Kong department and working for me when I became governor was Peter Ricketts, who was immensely um, supportive. It couldn't be said of his successor, but you know, um, I'm quite restrained in what I say about it. <laughs> um, there's a lot more in, my, in, the, in the original diary, I can tell you. Okay, will the other... 800,000 words be available in the Bodleian? They will be available in the Bodleian. So, so um, there'll be people, I imagine, writing defil theses on it. Yeah, but perhaps um, we could have a, a bridlet trip to uh, <laughs> the Bodleian Library. Um, you, you mentioned the, the change in China and, and Xi Jinping, and that's, I think, becoming increasingly clear to anybody. Uh, you, what, you don't really talk, well, you do talk a bit about Taiwan in the book, but not, not, in, uh, not in detail. But how do you think that now plays? Because, I mean, one analysis has been that the Chinese wouldn't push their luck in Hong Kong because they wanted to show Taiwan that one country, two systems, you know, was a, a model that would allow them to preserve and therefore they would come back to the mothership. Um, but that now seems to have changed um, both the attitude in Hong Kong but, and the attitude in, in Taiwan. And you hear plenty of people saying it's just a matter of time before there is a, a, a military struggle in relation well, to Taiwan. How do you think? Well, one, one issue which has made people more um, pessimistic about Taiwan is that um, one country, two systems has been trashed by the Chinese. Mm -hmm. So since it was meant originally to apply to Taiwan, the Taiwanese can see what, uh, what it means. I was interested the other day when my uh, agent, my literary agent, 
um, asked me if I was happy um, to flog the rights to, of my book to a publisher in Taiwan who wants to produce a, a, a Chinese language version. And that's because the Taiwanese are yep. so interested in, in the story. Um, it would, of course, be um, lunacy for the, for the Chinese to invade um, uh, Taiwan, which is quite difficult militarily, among other things. Um, there's only about I think, 14 beaches or something, and there's 100 miles of uh, sea to negotiate. It would, it would destroy the, um, I think, the Chinese economy, not least because of uh, China's dependence on semiconductors um, from, from Taiwan, but for other reasons as well. Um, but it may be uh, that with other reasons for supporting um, uh, the Chinese communist regime in China itself starting to come under a bit of strain, um, grievance-based nationalism, grievance-soaked nationalism will start to, to appeal to <coughs> Xi Jinping as a way of appealing to the to the public, but it would be a crazy thing to do. Well, what should our attitude to Xi Jinping now be? Because uh, I mean, in a way, the, the the lesson of your memoirs in the in the nineties, um, it seems to me that if if you were firm enough, and as long as your ground was reasonably based in the in the joint declaration, you couldn't obviously do things that were massively outside it. Um, but as long as you were firm. You know, the Chinese would eventually huff and puff and then sort of come round and moderate their position. But is that really possible in relation to Taiwan? I mean, how, what, what should our, if you were asked now to be Foreign Secretary, what, sh, what would your watchword be in terms of our attitude to China? Well, well, two things, just as I think that we have to have a firm line in dealing with Russia over Ukraine, so we have to have a firm line in dealing with, with China, both about uh, trade and, and other similar issues and over security issues. Um, because otherwise, um, uh, what happens to the canary down the mine? And we can see what's happened with Hong Kong, um, canary throttled. Um, and uh, we shouldn't kid ourselves that um, the Chinese want the same sort of world or the same sort of society that we want. When, when, um, when uh, Kennan wrote um, his brilliant essay about the Soviet Union, after in 1946, there's a sentence in it which um, I think is, is enormously telling. Uh, when he says, um, w we should recognize that their view of, uh, of reality and our um, uh, view of reali reality are incompatible. And I think that's true today. I don't think it means that we should um, uh, put a wall around China, um, but I think it does mean that we shouldn't and betray our own values in dealing with China. And to a considerable extent, um, we've operated on a basis of self-delusion with, uh, with China. Um, the assumption, for example, that sooner or later, inevitably, um, economic change and technical change would produce political change. So when, um, for example, the Chinese um, joined the WTO, um, Tony Blair said China's route to democracy is now unstoppable. Well, <laughs> and I think, I think there's, there's two bits of self-delusion. Um, one is that, and the other is that you can only do business with China um, if you accept their political narrative, if you do what they want on political issues. And I simply don't believe that's true. I mean, there's, there seem to me to be uh, two variant uh, variations of a thesis about what's happened in China in recent years. One is, um, that they've always been like this, you know, that it's a communist party and it's been monolithic and that's etc. Uh, and uh, you could not expect any different. The second is, well, there was a strand of thinking, perhaps uh, Deng Xiaoping himself originally, perhaps Zhu Rongji, um, who were moving in a more open direction, at least in economic terms and possibly even slightly in political terms. And that that's been turned on its head uh, by Xi Jinping. And you can see the impact constitutionally. You know, he's now leader forever, whereas the others did believe in, in rotation. The party believed in that, and it did happen. Um, wh where do you come out on that? You know, is this, have they always been like this? Um, or has Xi Jinping been a real change? Um, unhelpfully, I think both those propositions have some truth in them. <laughs> First of all, I, I think the best, probably the best historian of, of modern China, 
is uh, somebody called Frank Decotta, who's just produced uh, a wonderful book called uh, um, China After Mao. Mao died in 1976. And he wrote three volumes about um, China under Mao, one about the Great Leap Forward, one about the um, Great Famine when 42 million people died, um, one about the Cultural Revolution. And Frank de Cotta's method of working, he's a Dutch historian, was to go round the provincial party archives, um, the government archives, and to, some, to an extraordinary extent, he had access to them. And those, for, those three volumes are about the life of ordinary people under Mao. The, the next one, ditto, um, what's happened since Mao. And part of his thesis is we kid ourselves if we think that a Marxist-Leninist system is capable or understands how to reform itself. So I think that is partly true, but it's also true at the same time that um, after Mao, Deng Xiaoping uh, did try to broaden the leadership. Um, there was an opening to the global economy. Um, that was true under, under uh, Jiang Zemin and under Hu Jintao. But it, but it, but it came at, a, at what the Chinese thought was a cost. Um, and one has to remember, for example, how much the lessons they took, took from what happened in the Soviet Union were first um, that uh, um, you shouldn't allow uh, businesses to become too powerful like the high-tech companies and Xi Jinping's been cracking down on them. Second, second uh, criticizing the past as Khrushchev um, criticized Stalin was a terrible mistake and Gorbachev, Perestroika and so on really fundamentally weakened the system and it meant you couldn't hold on to power. Sh Xi Jinping, I think, um, coming after Hu Jintao. Um, Xi Jinping came at a time when I think a lot of the leadership were getting worried about the impact of globalization and urbanization and the internet on their ability to hold on to power. And it, it came at also at a time when the leadership was spooked by the effort of Bo Xi Lai, um, who'd been commerce minister and then when was mayor of Chongqing, and the then head of the security and, in effect, the energy industry, Zhou Yongkang, uh, to elbow their way, in, way into the leadership. And the Chinese leadership, I think, were really worried that they were starting to lose control over the country, north, south, east, um, west, and center, to, to use their language. So I think um, Xi Jinping comes at a time when the Chinese are worried about whether the, the, the fundamental uh, te tenets of their belief that the Communist Party has to hold on to power um, was being questioned. And Xi Jinping added to that that not only had the Communist Party itself to be in control, but he had to be in control of the Communist Party. Um, and uh, um, you know, that's what he's done only recently with the leadership team he's put in place, all of whom are his men. So I think it is a fundamental change. And I think it also reflects um, a document that was produced about the same time that he took over the leadership, which has the rather Orwellian title, um, uh, Communique Number no. Nine, which sets out, which sets out um, the reasons why the by party cadres and government cadres should be engaged in an intense struggle uh, against Western values, freedom of speech, um, uh, liberal economics, democracy, um, freedom of assembly, and so on, and all those things identified as the threat existential threat to Chinese communism, and in a very real sense, they were a description of Hong Kong. You, you refer to the, in that answer to the relations between Xi Jinping and, and business in, uh, in China, and I, I'd like to pick up, going back to the, the Hong Kong narrative, the impact of business um, on you and on policy, because I think that's quite, interesting and, a, and a, an issue of permanent interest, I think, in, uh, in the UK. And you are not sparing in your criticism, for example, of the then chairman of HSBC, uh, who went round bad-mouthing you and saying you shouldn't be worrying your head about this non democratic nonsense. Um, and you also refer to uh, Henry Keswick, uh, who ran Jardine Matheson, where you say nicely, I thought, that he failed to comprehend the whole purpose of the British Empire was not to increase his personal fortune, um, <coughs> which uh, an easy mistake to make if you're Henry Keswick, I think. But um, the, um, it seems to me you end up pretty critical 
of the business community and its uh, failure to sort of stand up for any values in Hong Kong and just in the interest of a quick buck. Is that fair? Yeah, it is pretty fair. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's also fair to say that the more critical business leaders were, the more you could depend on learning in due course that they had foreign passports. So they were, they were perfectly happy um, to uh, uh, go along with, with uh, proposals by, from Beijing, which would limit the freedoms of the people who worked for them. But they wanted to be able, if necessary, to get on a plane and get out. They would even quite like to be able to do it with a, with a CBE or a knighthood. Um, and it's, it, there's, there's quite a close relationship between, between um, foreign passports and criticism of the outgoing um, uh, British government. It's quite interesting, um, looking back, um, how the ordinary people of, of, when I say the Chinese people of Hong Kong, uh, have behaved. Um, the queues outside the British consulate recently to sign the condolence book for, um, for Queen Elizabeth, um, uh, with many of them having to run the gauntlet of uh, police interest in them. What, what I think a lot of um, particularly expatriate business leaders, though arguably not the American business community, they were really, really strong on all these, on all these issues. What I think um, a lot forgot, a lot of people forgot was who were the people of Hong Kong? Um, the Chinese themselves have only recently um, encouraged one to put a spotlight on that. Um, the new um, textbooks which schools have to, have to use uh, in the history of Hong Kong um, deny that there was ever a, it was ever a British colony. And they say it was an occupied territory, which is a bit of an own goal because you then ask yourself who occupied it? Hong Kong was occupied by refugees from Chinese communism. People who um, swam, uh, crawled over barbed wire, stowed away like Jimmy Lai, who's at present facing the rest of his life uh, uh, in, in prison, the, the entrepreneur. They, they made Hong Kong, and to tell them now um, that they should define their patriotism by whether or not they love the Communist Party is an absurdity. Um, and I think that some of the some business leaders um, tended to assume that the only way they could make money, either in Hong Kong or in China, was by going along with whatever the Chinese Communist Party said. And I think quite a lot of them um, were treated with a degree of private derision in their Beijing as a, as a, as a result of their, of their behavior. To have, to have um, British politicians who in retirement had become the chairman of uh, big public companies um, telling Chinese leaders uh, that, uh, of course, all this democracy stuff is is, um, over, is exaggerated. Uh, you do things much better here. You know, it, it, it made one squirm a little bit. And it encouraged um, something I felt more and more strongly as I get got older. That when people do or say things which are wrong, you should call them out. I, I had a journalist, I have more than one, but there was a journalist friend of mine who died a few months ago was an American, originally an American Maoist uh, called Jonathan Mursky. Um, and Mursky, I don't know anybody who's, who stormed out of more dinner parties than, than Jonathan Mursky. Um, he, was, he was beyond feisty. And it was partly related to that sense that when people said things that you thought were wrong, you should say it. Mursky had been covering the events in uh, Tiananmen Square and he was standing with a group of students. Um, and one kid, um, as they hear pop, 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 one kid pulls on his sleeve and says, uh, don't worry, old man, don't worry, grandpa, he says, um, they're only using plastic bullets. At which point this kid falls dead in Mursky's arms, covered him with blood. And it encouraged Mursky to think that when people um, do and say things, which are wicked, you should say they're wicked and you should call them out. And I think um, it reflects very badly on people who are prepared to, um, uh, provided they've got an escape route, um, to uh, sign up for all sorts of outcomes for the people who work for them, um, which are less ag agreeable than disappearing over the horizon themselves. On that point, by the way, you, you mentioned um, 
a couple of times in the book, Dennis McShane, who was a Labour MP, who produced some figures this last week, so it's saying that in 2016, 40 members of Parliament, this is including Commons and Lords, had Irish passports, and the number is now 321. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, I have a... Is there any a... relationship here between... <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think, it, I think it touches on the um, issue of um, Brexit, which is an interesting issue. Um, my great-grandfather was Irish. Um, he was born in 1829 um, and left Roscommon because of the potato famine. Um, uh, if, he, if it had been my grandfather, I could have claimed an Irish passport as well. But I would have thought perhaps that people would think I was hypocritical when I then talked about um, the British national interest, so I haven't done it. Uh, but Boris's father, of course, is a French citizen. Yeah. Well, Nigel Lawson is a resident, anyway. One, one other thing, I'm going to open it to, uh, to the rest of you fairly, fairly soon, but there's another, uh, we've gone through the sort of business, you know, the civil service and the business community's attitudes. Um, quite a lot of what you spend your time doing in the later stages um, was related to the Court of Final Appeal. Um, which is the ultimate um, arbiter of justice in, in uh, Hong Kong. Um, and you, know, you worked hard to institute a, a system which was as, as good as it could reasonably be. Uh, on that Court of Final Appeal, um, there are still UK judges. Um, and indeed, they include people from near here. Uh, and you say in your book, the main judicial authority is in practice to be the Communist Party, now the securities law in. And Hong Kong Watch, um, you also quote a couple of times, say that the British judges give a veneer of legitimacy on a fully compromised system. So should our judges go? Well, um, two of them, of course, who were sitting judges decided not to go, including yeah. Lord Reid. Um, and it was a huge embarrassment, I think, when he decided himself not to sit with his colleague in the Court of Final Appeal. And um, Liz Truss, uh, then uh, Foreign Secretary, implied, or I think stated explicitly, that they were um, resigning from the Court of the Final Appeal because she told them not to, be, not to sit in it. And I thoroughly disapprove of politicians telling judges what to do. Um, and I think that was a damaging thing for her to have said. And I have always said, made the point that I'm not going to tell British judges whether they should um, sit on the Court of Final Appeal or not. But I would find it difficult, for example, um, if I had made the speeches on the relationship between um, freedom of speech and the rule of law that Neuberger has made to still find myself sitting on the Court of Final Appeal. Um, I'd find it difficult to make um, if I'd made some of these speeches, very good speeches, on civil disobedience, which one or two others have made, and sit on the Court of Final Appeal. So I'd find it difficult to do it myself, but I'm not going to tell them uh, what they should do. But I just watch or observe what happens sometime with a slight um, uh, the, the raised eyebrow. Um, they will, of course, um, uh, I think of as far as possible, when, when panels of judges are chosen for cases, um, I think there will be very... Uh, considerable efforts made to keep them out of the most sensitive um, national security law cases. But the national security law, this Chinese law, has seeped, has leached into jurisdiction over the common law, for example, in, in treating issues like bail um, or jury trial or openness of, of trials. Um, so I think that, uh, um, but by and large, the national security law is what really matters in Hong Kong, not necessarily the common law. Mm. Well, the, um, uh, so I'll, I'll give you a couple, uh, I'll just a couple more questions and then I'll open it out to the audience. On the um, Conservative Party attitude to China, uh, I mean, you describe well the tensions in the, in the 90s um, and uh, the tendency of people who just saw China as a market, you know, we've got to be in there. Um, and um, some of them perhaps didn't, think very hard about what that meant, but I mean, that was their view. Um, but interestingly, the uh, currents of opinions, uh, currents of opinion in the Conservative Party do seem to have changed somewhat. And you now have quite a group um, on the right of the party, uh, people like Ian Duncan Smith, who are very hostile to China. And we've seen that in the Huawei case and, uh, and all of that. 
Um, uh, and uh, I find that um, I intriguing, the way that has changed. How do you, wh why do you think that's happened? And do you think that that is now to be regarded as a sort of mainstream Conservative Party view on China with, um, you know, so which is a big contrast with David Cameron's approach and George Osborne's approach. Which the golden is, age. Say, yeah, the golden age of relations. Um, well, I think one reason for the change is the golden age has proved to be not all that golden. And um, you're quite right in saying that China has, has um, to an extraordinary extent, extent, united the Conservative Party in a way that some issues haven't. So um, I can't think of what I'm talking about. Um, but um, uh, I think it's, it's, it's perhaps the most successful piece of uh, soft or hard diplomacy that the Chinese have done um, in recent years is to, is to produce the situation in which Ian Duncan, Smith and I are in the same, on the same side of, <laughs> of an argument. Um, I think it probably reflects the extent to which Chinese behavior has started to both offend people's um, uh, sense of morality in Xinjiang, forced abortions, forced sterilization and so on, and the extent to, to which China has been perceived as a threat to our values and a threat to our security, um, even though it's a, it's a long way away. Um, and I think that has, has helped to produce a sort of Russia-Ukraine effect in the, uh, in the Conservative Party and elsewhere in, in politics. And it is, of course, a matter of some embarrassment um, to China that they're seen by a lot of people as an accomplice to what um, President uh, Putin is doing in, in Ukraine. So I think those things have all contributed to um, making more and more conservatives pretty dubious about about the um, the golden age and what came after it. What are the you know? I, I produce in in my book uh, figures on the relationship between uh, our exports to China and the extent to which we had what was allegedly a benign relationship with China on their on their side. It, the relationship, if it exists, is inverse. Um, before I became governor, and um, when everything was apparently hunky-dory, which isn't actually true, um, our exports were coming down. In, in the period when I was governor, when we were endlessly having these rows, um, our British exports went up by a ha higher proportion than any other country in the OECD. And I, don't, I think the Chinese, by and large, do business on the same basis as everybody else. Not entirely. Um, but they try to get what they want at the best possible price. And if Western companies, if Westerners convince themselves that in order um, to do business with China, you've got to go along with whatever China says, then so be it. Well, the pattern Duncan Smith axis, you heard, you heard about it first here, um, is uh, an interesting one. You also say, actually, curiously, it's a bit of an aside point, but at one point you referred to meeting Jacob Rees-Mogg, whom you describe as a kind and amusing young man. Is that still your view? Well, um, <laughs> he's not um, young. <laughs> um, my, my, he was. Um, my, uh, when I was first a Conservative candidate in Bath, um, the first few months, we had nowhere to live. And his parents, William, um, uh, William in particular, and his mother, were very kind to us, and we rented from them a cottage for, I think, 25 shillings a week while we found somewhere more permanent. They were incredibly um, kind. Um, I disagreed strongly with both of them on Europe and on other issues. But when um, uh, Jacob left university and what I wanted was working in, or getting some experience in banking in Hong Kong, um, we, we gave him a, a roof over his head. And to my um, daughter's, my youngest daughter's embarrassment, he used to help her with her maths homework. Um, she pointed out she didn't do very well in maths, but anyway, <laughs> she was, uh, she was um, and he was, he was, he was, he was then 20-something um, going on 50. I mean, <laughs> go, go, on a, go on a hike with, with Jacob and he'd be wearing um, a three-piece suit and highly polished brogues. Um, I've seen him in a, in a, in a 
toweling dressing gown at a swimming pool, but that's the most informal I've ever seen. Him. So I, w I, was, I was simply being um, uh, courteous about him, and um, I think his political views are pretty um, strange, but anyway. <laughs> Let me open it out now to uh, the um, floor. Ah, lights, yes, I can see. Now, who would like to pile in? Yes, one down, uh, down here, about sort of row seven or something. Great. Hi, I'm Fiona Anderson. I was a BBC news producer in Hong Kong from 95 to 97, and I've absolutely loved reading the diaries. I think they are a brilliant account of the hard slog, continuous slog with the Chinese, uh, with some very amusing pen portraits of British politicians and businessmen, the Jacob Rees-Mogg portrait among them. Um, none of the questions have appertained to what those who love Hong Kong, like you and I do, um, should be doing about the people in Hong Kong now. How can we support them? Is it a done deal? Is the canary dead? Do we just wash our hands and, and weep and say, well, that's it? How do we support them now? That's my question. Well, to, to, to a considerable extent, um, we behaved better than I thought we would. When I was in Hong Kong, I was endlessly battling about visa-free access from people from Hong Kong um, generous treatment of what we call BNO passport holders, um, uh, and uh, I'm uh, to some extent surprised, but very pleased that we've actually delivered on most of those promises. Indeed, we've gone further. David Alton and I, in the House of Lords, and some in the Commons, um, got an extension of BNO passport holders to the children of BNO passport holders to let them in. So, I think we've been, to our benefit, quite generous about. Um, Hong Kong's coming here to live, and um, uh, overwhelmingly, it's been young professionals who've come, teachers, doctors, uh, lawyers, um, my old school, the new chemistry teacher I found the other day was, was from Hong Kong. I was, in, I was in Oxford a week or two after and saw a couple with a younger man at the, the road looking in the window of the car, recognizing me stopped and talked to them. They were the parents of a young guy who just qualified as a doctor and was coming to work for the, for the NHS. Um, so we've, we've uh, tried to behave properly towards those people for whom we have a responsibility. And I think they'll make a huge contribution to our community. But, but, what can we do about Hong Kong itself? I think the important thing is to go on talking about it, um, not forgetting about it. Um, to use a phrase I used just now, calling out Chinese bad behavior. For example, over, uh, Jimmy Lai and Cardinal Zen um, are about to be, um, Cardinal Zen's trial I think begins this week, and Jimmy Lai they will try to put away forever. Um, and we should um, make sure that the world doesn't forget about them. The most difficult thing and the most difficult question I have to answer is when young people, young Hong Kongers, ask me whether they should go back or not. I was talking to a group at, at Oxford University on the other night who just finished their master's in public policy degrees at the Blavatnik School in Oxford. And they were, um, they were both, they were two young Hong Kong civil servants. And they asked me whether they should go back to Hong Kong. Before that it had been um, a couple of medical students who just finished their doctorates. One was one had done a doctorate on on uh, diabetes at Oxford, and their girlfriends. Should we go back to Hong Kong? It's an impossible question for me to answer. Um, just impossible. I can I could answer it for my own kids, but how can I answer it for other people? <laughs> Um, it, sorry, it makes me a bit emotional to think about it because um, I can't possibly tell them to do things which um, I might not be brave enough to do myself. And maybe it's going to be all right. Maybe, and I, I, I can do a riff on this about how you can't um, lock up an idea, how sooner or later the ideas, the sort of society we believe in um, will triumph. Um, you know, dictatorships never end well, did I, did I can do that. 
until I'm blue in the face. But but looking at a young couple um, whose lives are in front of them and telling them they should go back to Hong Kong rather than go to America or or Britain or stay in Britain or Australia, it's extremely difficult. And I find that um, as difficult as anything I've had to do. Um, do I see another hand? Yes, I can see a hand about sort of halfway down. Yes, I think it, it, the microphone is on its way to you quickly. Okay. Thank you. I, I just wonder if we can take a moment in, uh, to do with calling out bad behavior to remember uh, the opium wars and what Britain did to China. If we could just take a moment to remember, remember that. But my question is, um, is, bridging, is bridging the Hong Kong, your Hong Kong position and being Chancellor of Oxford University? And first a comment and then a question. Uh, I spoke to a senior lecturer at Oxford University and some foreign Chinese students fear that other, some other foreign Chinese students are reporting back to the Chinese government on them. Um, I'm told that they're not, some of them are not signing their essays, uh, wishing to be as anonymous as possible, or they're requesting outdoor tutorials at Oxford so as not to be overheard. And this is not a COVID measure. Um, are you aware of this, Mr. Patton? and what can be done about this problem? On the first point, um, uh, I don't think you'd find anybody who'd made um, more speeches in, as a British politician than me about um, uh, the way in which we acquired Hong Kong, um, particularly the opium wars in the 1830s and 40s, but also the, um, the imperial grab for China at the, in the later stages of the Qing, when we got the new territories uh, on, a, on a long lease. And I said, uh, I've said on many occasions, not least when I was leaving Hong Kong, that none of us would now seek to justify, um, given uh, our contemporary views on, on morality, or even um, views on morality at the time, the way in which large parts of the British Empire were acquired. In Hong Kong, however, we provided an infrastructure um, which uh, uh, the Chinese themselves used to uh, clamber up and produce an astonishingly prosperous and open and free society. So um, it shouldn't be regarded as, as entirely um, as all bad what we did by any means in, in Hong Kong. We produced, we helped produce, albeit with those beginnings, an astonishingly uh, successful free society. Uh, on the position of and it's not just in Oxford, it's, in, it's uh, across the board. Um, uh, the extent to which we can guarantee students at our universities the same sort of liberal with a small L experience that we would uh, um, expect uh, all students to have, and the extent to which we can do that is something that has to be looked at very hard. And I think we're better at doing it at Oxford than some other universities. You talked about signing essays and so on. That is, in a sense, the easiest part, because um, in the, if you're studying um, social sciences, if you're studying uh, Chinese history, for example, you can, and we have, tried to put in place arrangements so that um, you know who's taking part in seminars, uh, you control, or try to control the people taking part in seminars, you ensure that people writing an essay, for example, on Xinjiang or Tibet, um, are able to do that in a conditions of anonymity because, I repeat, we know perfectly well that the Chinese themselves at universities employ narcs to report on what other students are doing. So we have to be very careful about it. I think it's more of a problem outside China studies as to whether normal uh, student behavior um, is something which people will, will report back on private conversations and so on. And that is something we have to be very tough on, very hard on. I think the government have been pretty pathetic about the way they've reacted to the Manchester Consulate General. Um, I think we've been, so far, not nearly outspoken about, enough about um, the suggestion that there are 
informal Chinese police stations um, in our society, which are keeping an eye on people. We have to be very careful about these things. So the answer is yes, we're, we're very aware on it, of, of it at Oxford. Um, I hope others are as aware of it as, as we are. But uh, people like Rana Mitter, who's our professor of China studies, Todd Hall, who runs the China Center, um, are very aware of these things indeed. And so are we, so we are right across the board. Thank you. Uh, yes, a uh, couple down here. Uh, row four, and then I'll come to you next. Um, first of all, um, it's lovely to see you here, Lord Patton, um, in Bridport. I'm from Hong Kong, and I used to see you all the time on TV when I was when I was small. Um, but my oh, actually, first of all, I just want to um, you know relate back to the last question. As someone who is doing a political PhD on Hong Kong at Cambridge, I can confirm that that fear is very real. Like, what can I publish? What can I not publish? So, um, yeah, so that's the first point I would like to make. It's not just a worry about you, it's a worry about yes, friends my or sources as well. in Hong Kong or in China. Yeah. Yes, um, but my question is actually about Lee Kuan Yew, because um, in your book, you mentioned several encounters with Lee Kuan Yew, um, you know, Singapore, the Singaporean leader. Um, in the beginning, you seem to have, like, you, the two of you seem to have exchanged some candid views about how to deal with China, etc. But then there was this lecture he gave at Hong Kong U where he was basically using, again, like related back to the last question, British colonial history, to basically say that uh, your democratic reforms in Hong Kong could not be genuine because, you know, what Britain has done to other colonies in the past. Um, you sort of felt that you're stabbed in the back. So, like, my question is 30 years on, how would you evaluate uh, Lee Kuan Yew as a leader as well as your friendship or relationship with him? Thank you. I'm not sure it was a friendship, but, but rather flatteringly, um, even though we disagreed uh, quite strongly about a number of issues like, quote, Asian values, um, even though we disagreed quite strongly, I mean, he, he would always um, ask to see me if I was in Singapore or see me um, in, in Hong Kong or even in London. Um, uh, and uh, admittedly, I was normally on receive and he was normally on broadcast, but um, <laughs> Henry Kissinger said to me, sorry, name dropping. Henry Kissinger said to me on one occasion, um, uh, at least he doesn't think you're stupid, uh, which was a flattery of a sort. Um, <laughs> Look, um, he, he was a passionate believer in, in social engineering. There's a wonderful book by Rex Warner called The Aerodrome, which should be as well known as, as, um, as Animal Farm. It's a fantastic satire about social engineering written in the 1930s. Um, and I'll tell you this story about Lee Kuan Yew. When I was doing a some filming for the BBC about the first book I produced after I left Hong Kong called East and West. And we were looking at, at some different attitudes to the West in, in Asia and the other way around. And we went to film in Singapore and as, we would, as, as luck would have it, it was national, I think it was called National Politeness Week. And Lee Kuan Yew asked me, I say if I, I ask if I can um, film Lee Kuan Yew for, for this um, program. And he says, absolutely right, that's fine, provided I can use, or so Singapore television can use the film as well as the BBC. Just sort of check on me. So we have a discussion and I ask him, I had one critical question, I said, what I don't understand is why you're so awful to the people who disagree with you. You, you, you look, looking at the success of the, this small city-state, and he couldn't have done what he did in, in Malaysia or, in, or Indonesia, but look, looking at your huge success, you'd win elections here without being so beastly to them, without trying to drive them out of, out of politics, but with financial sanctions and so on. Why do you do it? And he said, you don't understand, he said, about this place. He said, look at all this social housing. He said, that's me. And when we put it up, I, I had to teach people how to use a urinal. Without me, 
None of that would happen. They wouldn't have known what to do with these bastards. Now, when we came to broadcast this interview, pretty well the only bit the BBC kept in was the bit about the urinal. <laughs> the only bit that Singapore television took out was the bit about the urinal. <laughs> and I do think that the, um, the, the question of social engineering um, uh, possible in a society <laughs> of the surprise of Singapore, and it was, a, it was brilliantly successful. But I didn't, uh, I didn't agree with him on all that much. It, w w one other story which some people used to, used to use against me to demonstrate what a liberal wimp I was. I once said to him, how did you deal with the triads when you, be when you became um, prime minister in Singapore? And he said, oh, it's easy. He said, we rounded them up and we locked them all up in Shangi prison. So I said, how many were there? And he said, about a thousand. So I said, were they all triads? And he said, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take one more uh, down the front here. Yeah. Um, Lord Patton, you've said you very much approve of people calling others out. <laughs> I was quite impressed when you were on the radio the other day talking about the Vatican and how pathetic they have been over the trial of a cardinal in Hong Kong. Um, perhaps you'd like to amplify a little bit on that. Um, in Latin or in the vernacular? <laughs> <laughs> I think for most people here, the vernacular. Well, look, um, Cardinal Zen is one of the most uh, I'm a Catholic. Um, Cardinal Zen is one of the most wonderful priests I've ever met. Um, you can tell why there are people in any big bureaucracy like the Catholic Church, why some people will find him tiresome. He doesn't toe the line. He's wonderful. He's a wonderful pastor. Example. One of the politicians with whom he'd had the most furious arguments over the years um, about democracy, also a Catholic, um, uh, got locked up on fairly spurious grounds, but anyway. And Cardinal Zen lives on one side of Hong Kong Island and prison, Stanley Prison's on the other. And Zen used to get the bus every morning, Zen probably in his early 80s, he's now 90, across to Stanley Prison to say Mass to this um, guy in his prison cell every day. He's wonderfully pastoral. He's hugely um, articulate about Christian views of human dignity and justice. Um, and very, very, to put it mildly, dubious. Um, in the same way that dichotomous, as I said earlier, about the ability of the Chinese Communist Party to behave well or to reform itself. Now, um, he's, standing on, he's standing trial because he was trustee of a charity which was providing funds for people's legal defenses. People who were being um, threatened with imprisonment for, I don't know, who knows how long, for trying to organize um, uh, votes to determine who should who should represent which constituency where, primaries. So he's, he's on trial, or about to be on trial. And this is coinciding with a time when the Vatican itself is signing a secret deal for the second time, third time, which is allegedly going to end the division between the patriotic church in China, which is the one the, the uh, Communist Party approves of, and the underground church, which is the one that Zen um, himself would be more, more keen on, because he doesn't think you should actually allow communist bureaucrats to appoint Catholic bishops. Now, the, the Vatican says, well, you know, we know there are embarrassments and awkwardness about this, but this is a way of, in which we can protect all 12 million Catholics in China. 
there's a degree of delusion about it, whether you can trust what the, what the Chinese Communist Party is doing. The deal hasn't been published. Nobody knows what it actually contains. And the idea that it's actually letting, going to ensure that um, the Vatican has the final word in the appointments of bishops who will be chosen initially by the Communist Party. Nobody knows whether that's really true or not. And there are at least two bishops who are still in prison. There are umpteen priests who are in prison. There are umpteen priests who have been driven out of their jobs um, and are now working in the fields or in factories because they wouldn't sign a loyalty deal with the Chinese Communist Party. And there are still crucifixes being taken down. And there are persecutions of other Christian groups. And there are persecutions of in Xinjiang where forced sterilization and forced abortions are being, are being as, as, the, as the UN has, has agreed. So all those things are happening. And my view is the Vatican are being um, pretty, in, just, pretty excessively innocent in the way they deal with the Chinese Communist Party. Naive is a very good way of putting it. Um, and I think it's important um, to say that for Catholics like me, and quite a lot do. Quite a lot of those who do are opposed to Francis um, on other reasons. I'm a huge supporter of Francis, but I think he's got this badly wrong. Um, and I think there are all sorts of reasons, including his devotion to uh, Matteo Ricci, uh, a Jesuit priest who was a great um, uh, scholar in China in the 17th century. But I think, I think the Vatican have got this badly wrong. And a point I always, always feel is whenever a church organization, whether Catholic or other, starts to talk about um, uh, raison, about um, uh, you know, state reasons for doing things, um, uh, you're always on a slippery slope. Um, churches should stand for moral values and make, uh, make a fuss about them when they're being uh, undermined. So um, uh, I feel very strongly about um, uh, Cardinal Zen, a decent um, elderly cleric. And you have to ask yourself, if the Chinese Communist Party is terrified of a 90-year-old priest, is this really the wave of the future? <laughs> I'm sorry to uh, have to bring this to a halt, but the, the next show um, is champing uh, at the bit outside. And so um, I want, however, not to end without saying two things. One, rather well, the practical thing, which is if you could keep in your seats while Chris goes out to the back to sign uh, books. Uh, but secondly, to say that this is a very engaging uh, read. Um, I particularly liked myself the, the description at the end of the uh, handover in 1997. I actually was present whilst you were getting wet. I was getting wet too, I have to say, um, in the, on the sort of parade, parade ground. But uh, uh, it was a very memorable occasion for, for me and my wife. But then your description of going off on the Britannia and taking a salute with the, the fleet and dolphins swimming around uh, and members of your family being sick um, <laughs> because of the sick. Uh, it was is a very, um, a very moving and in, engaging piece, as indeed is the whole book. I strongly recommend it to you. I thank you for coming and thank Chris particularly for his question. One other point, which is about the um, leaving and about the weather. Uh, it was raining um, cats. It was raining like it was this morning when my wife and I were going going on for a walk, going for a walk on the cliff. Um, uh, I I heard my um, political advisor, who was a China scholar, um, saying to a group of journalists as the team as the rain poured down. Uh, of course, he said, "There's an old Chinese saying: uh, when a great man leaves, the heavens weep." <laughs> and I said to him afterwards, you made that up, didn't you? <laughs>